caching is very similar to a subscription. It's, you know, I, I have some data that's stored server-side or, or, or on the edge that subscribes to the result of that query. And you might say, well, wait a second, what if the source code changes? I'll have to go manually invalidate that query. Well, that's not true because the query has to read the source code first before it executes the code, right? So the source code is in the read set to the transaction. So if you upload a new version of the function, it just changes the, you know, it conflicts with the read set, changes, changes the result and, 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 re, and invalidates the cache. James Cowling, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thank you, Jeff. It's really nice to be here again. So you are the co-founder and CTO of uh, Convex. Uh, Convex, uh, can you talk a little about what it is? I wrote down in my notes, it's primarily, according to my own assessment, it's pr primarily in the business of developer experiences is how I read it. Um, is that fair to say? Yeah, that is, that is fair. It's actually, I like that you said it's, de it's a developer experience platform and not a database. Because it is a database, it is a, we built a database. But Convex is designed as a, as a labor-saving initiative, ultimately. And our long-term vision, which you won't see written on our website right now, is you know, to make mostly back-end infrastructure a thing of the past and, and, and get us to a future where the vast, vast, vast majority of engineers are building applications, are building, building products that people use. Uh, so what is Convex? Convex is a, is, a, is a platform as a service. You might think of it a little bit similar to say something like Firebase, uh, but it's a platform that that you know has a database that handles execution and and and, and you can use it to build applications, um, primarily right now web applications and mobile applications, uh, and we can talk in a lot more detail about Convex as needed, but it really is designed as a, a platform where you can get started very very quickly and build productive applications very fast, um, you, you know in a, Product your full stack applications, but then it's something that's designed so that it will scale with the developer and with the team. So it's not something that you start using and and, and grow, you know, you prototype an app and then grow out of and have to have to hire a back end team. It's it's designed really so that you can use Convex for the, the full life cycle of your company. Okay. And so how does it I'm gonna say how does it manifest when I get started with Convex? I suppose there isn't a big Convex ID I download. Is it, um, I, I know it runs off TypeScript and, or JavaScript. So is it basically a bunch of libraries and, and you compile it and it does the, how does the, what, what does it look like when I get started? Yeah. Yeah, specifically, what does it look like, all right? We have a website, convex.dev, right? And we have a dashboard, dashboard.convex.dev, where you can go and see your data, et cetera. The main interaction you'll have with Convex is through our development libraries, right? There's a CLI tool to create a project. And then um, Convex currently is a, is, a, is a really great fit for React developers. So people who are building React applications and you pull in the, the Convex library and you code against those. Specifically how you interact with Convex is we like to think of a database or as a, as, as a backend, not as something where you send queries to or exchange you know, rows with, but, uh, but a platform where you actually run programs. And so if you want to say, write a query, let's pick the, you know, the classic kind of chat application, or let's say a to-do application, and you want to write a query that says, give me all my, you know, my un, undone, unread um, to-dos. You write that program in JavaScript or TypeScript, very naturally, like you would write any code, that runs on Convex's servers on the database, fetches the results for you. But very importantly, we actually run that code in a, in a V8 isolate. So we actually know what that code is doing. And as a result, you can subscribe to the results of that query. So if anything changes, for example, if someone marks one of those tasks as done, we'll automatically send those results to you over a WebSocket. Okay. Because we know if um, those inputs to that, that query function have changed, we can automatically cache this data for you at the edge. And so the idea with Convex is there's a set of design principles that are, that are designed such that you don't have to think or peer through the abstraction boundary of the back end. So your interface with Convex is writing functions that run on data and then execute them, subscribing to them. Now, the platform has storage, it has, it has search, it has all the things you would expect out of, a, out of infrastructure, but it's really designed so that you don't think of this as a bag of tools, but as one problem that, one platform that makes your problems go away, ideally.
So the way I visualized it when I had my cursory look was that basically you almost write your code as a as a developer and based off of that code it kind of infers the data model and does all the backend stuff from infrastructure to schemas to everything so that you just basically write your query and it figures out what the data would have to look like is that vaguely on the money absolutely that is certainly part of the platform, right? We have this kind of catchphrase inside the company where we say, yeah, day one is year two power, right? This is the experience we want a developer to have. So, you know, the team, most of the team here has run very, very large infrastructure before, knows how to build databases, knows how to build storage systems, has run, in, run backend teams, um, but doesn't want to go to product developers and say, use Convex, you'll be happy about this in a couple of years. When I go to developers and say, use Convex, you'll get your product shipped 10 times faster than you would otherwise. It just so happens we've chosen a set of abstractions such that if you do this, right, you build your product out of you know, deterministic, com composable functions. We handle the caching. We handle the subscriptions for you. We have our own WebSocket library for you that the product and the platform will scale with your company. So Convex is designed not to be a toy. It's a fully relational data model, right? It's, uh, you know, it has, has caching, it has schemas. Now, one thing you made reference to is schema inference. And this is, you know, this is part of the, um, this kind of day one easy to power. Uh, people love MongoDB. Well, you know, a few, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, people really loved MongoDB. And partly why they really loved it is you could just take your JSON and dump it in this thing and it would go away. And there'd be database people, Mongo actually has improved tremendously in terms of their kind of correctness story. But there was database people at the time who would, who would be very critical of Mongo and like, it's not a proper database. It doesn't, you know, do this and that. Um, but it solved the needs of the developers. They like, just give me something to throw some JSON in and then let me have it back. Okay. So Convex allows you to do this. You can write your application. You don't have to define a schema. You can just dump your data into Convex. Uh, we actually have in the background a schema inference algorithm that figures out the minimum schema that represents the type of your data in the system. That is done very efficiently. It has to be a very cool algorithm. We'll have to open source sometime. So when it comes time to define a schema, when you say, hey, I actually want type safety right now. I want to validate the inputs to my function. I want to make sure that only a certain type of data is in my system. You can just, you know, it's almost, we're well, not exactly one click, but you can just go copy the schema off the dashboard and, and use it. And you can obviously define your own schema as well. So these are kind of the, this is kind of this, this tension we're threading, but uh, you know, it doesn't feel like a tension. It's working quite well, right? But you can get started incrementally. You can start building and you can have a very good developer experience. I think, you know, if you're a, a React developer, you should go try it out. I think you'll really like it on day one. But I don't think this is a platform you're going to outgrow or find that it's encourage you to make bad choices. And there are, you know, this is this tension between a front end and back end. You know, if you just try to solve problems purely on the front end side, you can make life very easy for developers. But maybe you're encouraging people to make some bad choices, maybe to take some shortcuts, maybe write some things that don't scale. And if you solve things purely on the back end side, you're going to build this, you know, grandiose, wonderful infrastructure that no one can use. And so Convex's uh, desire as a company is to unify these both, right? It's basically infrastructure built for front-end people. Yeah, no, absolutely. To your last point, um, what this reminds me of is, is a, a little one-panel cartoon that I've seen where employees walk out of a failed startup, you know, carrying the kind of leftover laptops and stuff. And they said, uh, we are, it's like one engineer saying to the other, we added absolutely no business value but our schema was pristine and our infrastructure so robust. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, in many respects, Convex is almost like my apology to the world for a lifetime of being an infrastructure person and leading infrastructure teams. And I say this with love to all my, to my infra homies out there, right? But we only exist in service of the product, right? Like, just don't get this the wrong way, other way around. Like, nothing matters unless someone's building a product on top of it that affects a human being and in companies you talk about top line and bottom line top line is how you increase profitability how do you get new customers and bottom line is how do you minimize your costs infra usually is a is a bottom line 
um, optimization strategy. How do you keep the company running? How do you save money? And product application normally is how is a top line maximization strategy. How do you get more customers, right? And if if the you know, infra um, teams, backend teams always have to make sure the company will continue running, will scale, all that kind of stuff. But they live in service of the product. Right? And I think sometimes we get this the wrong way around, right? We don't realize that, you know, companies exist to solve a problem. And my dream, as I mentioned, right, is, you know, is with platforms like Convex to get us to the point where the vast, vast majority of people are just going and building products for humans to use. Um, and they're having a good time doing it and it works and it scales, which I don't think um, this, you know, Convex is amazing, wonderful, and the answer to the world's problems. But I don't think outside of this, we're really at that future yet because even with, with, with infrastructure as a service, AWS is amazing. It's still a bunch of tools you need an infrastructure team to put together to actually solve a problem. And, you know, the 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 this the interaction surface with the application needs to be all the way at at the at the application surface at the libraries people are using to build their application yeah so how do you know how to tackle that problem because like you said you are your background is infrastructure as is mine mostly i'm a devops platform engineer lots of infrastructure lots of server maintenance lots of cloud um, and I, I personally recently tried to actually do a little web application and I realized I have absolutely no idea how to approach it because I've never been a developer. I learned HTML, I think, four or three, like 15 years ago. So everything that happens in the browser nowadays is a mystery to me. Uh, and I've never acquired those skills. So uh, talk to me about your background and, and the background of the other people at convex how did you manage to get all the kind of disparate i suppose pieces of of, of kind of the the whole developer and operations experience together not just as as kind of stale bits of, of knowledge i know this i know this but also the, the the problems that need solving in in these domains and and how we can solve them all at once which it, which is what you're doing absolutely so the first thing i'll do is just is just say that your experience absolutely resonates with me. So the genesis of this company, you know, um, the the uh, uh, the co-founders Jamie, Sujay, and I, we all worked together at Dropbox for around eight years. We built um, a, a lot of the very large infrastructure systems there. So the big distributed storage system that was, you know, multiple exabytes, um, close to a million nodes. Um, the big distributed database there that ran four plus million queries per second. So a lot of very large infrastructure. We built databases many times before. And we came out and we promised never to build a database again. Uh, partly because we felt there's a lot of um, startups and companies out there that build infra first and then go around trying to find a use case for a second. And again, I say this with love, but I will kind of throw shade on kind of all the, the companies that's come out of Google where they just take some big piece of Google infrastructure and try to convince the world that, you know, a two person startup needs Kubernetes, which they don't. Right? Um, and so we came out and said, we'll, we'll, we're never going to write a database again. We promised ourselves this. And then we'd had exactly your experience. We tried to build other applications, front end applications, and we were like, wow, this is just needlessly complicated. Like it got worse over time. There was a time where there was the LAMP stack. You know, some of the maybe slightly older listeners will remember where you had, if, if I remember this correctly, Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. And you know, you could get a, a, a company going in a day. Many people did, you know. And nowadays, the, the amount of complexity you have to deal with to build a, a, a product these days is, is, is out of control. And we realized that, that the reason for this is that the infrastructure that exists on the market reflects the shape of the underlying technical solutions, not the shape of the problems people are facing. And so, you know, this is, this is the, the genesis of, of, of the company now. How do we um, build a team? How do, how do we think about, about building kind of composable abstractions? Uh, so when we um, built the storage system at, at Dropbox, which you know was a very, very large system, um, we were the first team in the world to deploy something called shingled magnetic recording at scale, so new hardware technology, at least at the time, uh, perhaps now you know the most efficient storage system in the world. Um, and... Uh, we had a very, very small software team. For 
some of this time, less than half a dozen people. And the only way you can do something like this is to think very deeply about simplicity, composability, how to not paint yourself into a corner, thinking very clearly about, about, about abstractions. And I can talk more about abstractions in a second. So I think we came into this with a very keen sense of um, how to design things simply and how to how to invest effort in um, in in building elegant composable components. Now, but we had to you know, build out a team, and so I think the DNA of of um, Convex right now is there's a lot of Dropbox folks. We have uh, a lot of folks who've come through uh, Google Photos uh, and um, have a very good sense of developer, you know, a very good product sense. Uh, there's folks from the old Bump team. If folks remember, Bump, Bump was was I think at one point the most popular app on the on the iPhone store. Um, who um, there's a, re a real killer, killer software team, Asana, etc. Um, but you asked about you know um, abstraction composability. Uh, I think the 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 the, the core influence uh, in, in in central to, to Convex is programming language design. Of all things, uh, Jamie and Sujay, my co-founders, are big programming language nerds. Uh, I'm a slightly less of a programming language nerd, but I did my PhD with a woman called Barbara Liskoff, and Barbara Liskoff uh, is a professor at MIT, um, very big in the programming language world, kind of the pioneer of abstraction in computer science, and 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 she thinks very very deeply about how can you make things simple. Uh, which we take for granted, but it's actually very hard. And I think the programming language community has a lot to, to teach the systems world about developer experience, composability, understandability, expressivity. Not just thinking of the world in terms of queues and databases, but thinking of the world and how do you express things in simple ways. You can look at languages like Haskell with software transactional memory, uh, the design of, of, of Rust, people thinking about queues instead of locks, you know, um, and there's a lot to be learned from these communities. So there's a lot of influence from languages like Haskell in Convex. Now, if I think about like, what does abstraction mean? It's just kind of a vague word, right? To me, abstraction means taking a, a complex, large set of information, putting a box around it, such that you, all you have to understand is the box and nothing inside of it. And a, success, a successful abstraction is one that has a, a simple shape of the box, so it's composable, it fits together with other components. It's powerful and it's useful, but it's also water. You don't have to open the box, right? So if I think of like, if I have a company and I hire a head of infrastructure or a backend, uh, backend team, their job is to make backend problems go away. Their job is not to come to me and ask what version of my SQL I wanna use, or do I want semi-sync replication or sync replication or read committed, or serializability, um, or even what regions um, I should deploy caching in. Right? Their job is to make problems go away. They abstract that problem for me so that I can then focus on other things and drive the company forward. So if we want to build a, a good development platform, it's very, very important that platform has a good abstraction. Right? We don't ask our developers, what region do you want to cache in? We just figure it out. We don't ask them, you know, um, what what uh, consistency model they want. We just provide them, you know, a strong consistency. They don't have to think about it. And so a lot of Convex is designed with this influence of programming languages, this influence of composability, this influence of abstractions, such that you can just take problems away from people, not add problems to them. That makes a lot of sense. The way I the way I always think of abstraction is making problems specific problems look like other problems because at the end of the day if we abstract them we use the very word in the definition they are all problems we've seen before and we can't we can't reinvent the wheel every time there is some sort of problem so we just use abstraction be it through common interfaces being be it through usually it is common interfaces isn't it because then our brain can look at a complex problem divided in huge Legos, say, I know this, I know this, I know this. Maybe there's a bit of interesting stuff we can re-engineer then, do something novel, but then we can actually solve the complex problem and, and, and bring value to the customer, uh, like you said. 
And I love that you, I love that you've used the example of human psychology, because I get asked a, a lot. You know, what if someone wants to be a good engineer? What should they read? What blogs should they read? What books should they read? What kind of topics should they learn more about? And generally, I would say you should learn more about human psychology. And I don't, it's probably not something you hear a lot. And for two reasons. One is engineers, we generally over-bias towards technical stuff and we, we under-bias towards the human side. Um, so if you're a software engineer, huge generalization, there's a good chance there's something you can learn more about human psychology. Right. The second is it's, it's just so, so informative in terms of how you can build good products and how you can communicate effectively as an engineer. So one thing you know we discuss sometimes is very similar to what you said about you know the working set in your mind. So you approach a new problem, you come and use convex, right? It's very so when you first start, you are confused. You're a new developer. You come to this platform. I don't know what this is. I don't know how this works. It's using up all this space in your stack. Let's say in your mind, right? There's so many new things and new ideas and new new words and new topics in your head. You don't know how they fit together. It's in your stack and that slows your brain down. Right? And the way you get better at any, any discipline, any domain, is not to keep adding things to your stack. It's eventually to take things on your stack, compressing them down to an abstraction and then putting them away on your heap. And I know this is not necessarily exactly how the brain, I don't know how the brain works, but this is my model for this and I think it does, it resonates with me. Right. So when we're introducing topics to people in Convex, we have to, to make sure that they're introduced in such a way that they can be compacted down to an abstraction and stored away for later. And so there were times early in the company where I think we made some mistakes, where the shape of Convex, this is going to sound, it wasn't Convex, it wasn't, it wasn't round. Like we had some gaps. It was like Convex is a database and it was a sync protocol. Uh, but we didn't do, we didn't handle storage, we didn't handle search, we didn't handle execution of arbitrary functions. So people would struggle, what is convex? And it wasn't able to be simply modeled in their brain and stashed away on their heap so they can start absorbing new information. So we added more features to make convex, you know, we, in, we have some differentiated features and some undifferentiated features. Uh, how we how we run transactions, how we um, have our, our sync protocol, how we do subscriptions, how we do automatic schema inference, highly, highly differentiated. How we handle storage, not particularly differentiated. We handle storage like kind of everybody else. Um, now, we, one could argue, hey, focus on the differentiated stuff, not the undifferentiated stuff. Our experience was it was much harder to understand convex without the full picture. So we added some more features. We kind of rounded out the shape of Convex and people find it much easier to understand now. It's more approachable and they can continue forward. So I think thinking about that, that human psychology side all the time, it, it, especially in, in engineering communication, don't hit someone with a million details at once. Give them the big picture, allow them to simplify things, stash it away in the heap, and then they can continue. Yeah, it's um, the word developer experience, I think, is chosen quite aptly and it, it, it's so similar in that sense to to user experience uh it, it, in in that you can't yeah you can't you can't just overwhelm the user with a million things at once what what i'm thinking of is um i've played portal the absolutely fantastic video game and um at some point i've, I've played it i think mistakenly with the developer commentary on and it actually walks you through how the levels are designed that first a user learns a novel concept and then does it two, three times until it's not just a bunch of new functionality, but it becomes, like you say, it's compressed. It becomes one concept. The brain has one kind of, I, I like to call it concept, one function that it can then just uh, use without having to process it all again. And then the user learns a new thing and then they learn a new thing. And then you, towards the end, you're, you're able to solve like these great puzzles in, I don't know, level 20 or whatever, um, that you would absolutely not know where to start if if you entered that um, a, a, as the first one. Game design is such a great example because um, I had a, I have a, a personal experience with things like Roblox and, and Minecraft, but I've seen friends, kids just build amazing things in these platforms. And like, how do, how do you build a rather complex set of emergent properties in a way that a child can understand? It's very impressive game design. And 
it'd be a huge mistake to to underestimate how much talent goes in to thinking about introducing concepts in a way that can sink in to even a six year old. They can understand, they can be familiar with, and then they can take that and 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 once they feel comfortable, once they understand, then they're off to the races and they can achieve so many things. Just for discussion's sake, I'm wondering what what the kind of opposite case here is, and it must be language. Uh, children, babies learning language. We don't, as parents, when we talk, I'm not a parent, but as humans who are grown-ups, we talk to children, um, we, we use some baby terms, but mostly we, we just talk to them normally, right? We explain what we're reading in a newspaper, what we're seeing out the window. We're not using a, a, a simplified grammar until they, they know how to use that, and then we speak to them more. And um, it, it works, but it only works after they've been exposed to it for like a year or two straight, and then they just take in all that information. And then at some point, they know how to speak. Um, but I think that's quite an exceptional uh, exception. <laughs> it's exceptional because you have to learn language to function mostly in society. But I mean, I think the quality of an abstraction relates even to how we interact with a domain. So I, I'm thinking right now about... Um, avoiding politics but you know tax code and regulations and um you know a lot of things in in the legal domain that have so many exceptions so many corner cases it's quite hard to understand the clear guiding principle behind you know why various tax exemptions exist and so most people kind of throw up their hands and they have no idea how it works and they say well i'll never understand it and i'll just go through the motions and i'll click some buttons in TurboTax or whatever so there's and and there's people who you know look for example at an engine and just see a million pipes and and boxes and they just their brain switches off and they have no relationship with the object i personally love mechanics and and because over time i have developed a sense for the abstractions in an engine and i can look at it at a car engine and see what the components do what they mean and i find that unintimidating but how someone interacts with an with an object with a with a with a domain comes down a lot to whether they understand it, uh, not just whether they can kind of recognize a bunch of disparate components. So I, I have an example of uh, um, at least a, a positive example of where where abstraction has, has helped in the design of convex. Um, and this is an example that that makes me look good as a software engineer. When there's not that many of them these days, so so humor me with it. Uh, so convex. Is a database and we run functions on behalf of the user and the code this the source code for those functions are stored in the database and we have automatic caching etc now when we first put the product there was no automatic caching so my job was to add caching to convex and consistent caching is a very hard job some people say consistent caching is one of the hardest problems in computer science getting this getting this correct um, and it's hard for a, for a variety of reasons. Um, and I'll give you an example of why it could be hard. So you run a function on convex, and then you want to cache the result of that function. Now, there's a whole lot of conditionals that affect whether that function is, uh, whether that cache result is correct at a given point in time. So convex is an optimistic concurrency control database where everything's serialized. So we can know as of a point in time whether that, whether that um, cache value is relevant. But there's a lot of things you have to check. For example, if you write a run a function, we cache the results, and then you change the source code for that function, that should invalidate the results of that of that cache because now it's different source code. Um, now that um, adds another conditional, and if the inputs to that function change, that also is a conditional that should invalidate the cache. And if you take a relatively naive approach to systems design, you're going to start just writing down every situ every situation where we should invalidate that cache. And over time, you'll build a very complex system that will break one day. Now, how caching works in Convex, we have a subscription mechanism. So when we run any transaction in Convex, we track all the data that that transaction has read. So we call it a read set. We know all the ranges of data that have been read. Quickly define what you mean by transaction in this context. A transaction is a function that runs on a database and it runs transactionally, so it will commit all or nothing, um, and it will be serialized. Um, so when that transaction runs, it reads some data from the database, and we record in an efficient kind of compact structure all the data that has been read, all the ranges that have been read. Now, we know 
that that result will stay exactly the same unless anything that was read has been changed. So every time you do a write in convex, we intersect that write with any active read sets. And we know if any of those subscriptions, those queries have changed. So we can very efficiently in, 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 um, in linear time, uh, send a, a subscription refresh message to the client. So let's think about how caching would be implemented. Well, um, caching is very similar to a subscription. It's, you know, I, I have some data that's stored server-side or, or, or on the edge that subscribes to the result of that query. And you might say, well, wait a second, what if the source code changes? I'll have to go manually invalidate that query. Well, that's not true because the query has to read the source code first before it executes the code, right? So the source code is in the read set to the transaction. So if you upload a new version of the function, it just changes the, you know, it conflicts with the read set, changes, changes the result and, 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 re, and invalidates the cache. So I was able to implement caching in Convex in literally one day. And I, I'm not a fast programmer these days. I've been a senior guy for far too long. I'm quite a slow programmer. But I was able to implement caching correctly and deploy it in one day because of composable abstractions. And these take serious work to get right, but you just know when you're on a set of composable abstractions because everything just works. And when you're not, everything's a disaster of if statements and retries and checks. Um, and you can see code that's been written, you know, there's locks everywhere. There's all these conditional statements, there's big, big notes and warnings, and you can see code that's been written with clean abstractions. It just fits together. Does this relate to gradual rigor? And if so, how? So you mentioned on your website the concept of gradual rigor, which I think is mostly what we talked about was the beginning of the of the podcast um, that you can start by just as a developer just writing the basically writing the business value and it won't uh, it won't come back to bite you later because um, it'll scale with you and, and you can uh, you can for example become more rigorous about your schema which initially was completely. Uh, inferred is that also a sort of uh, abstraction absolutely i mean now the, the the standards are different for the application and the platform so convex has to be the platform itself has to be rigorous from day one but if you think about a typical application where you want to do something dynamic let's say you have a shopping cart or a shopping website and you want the prices to update live right you could write code that manually goes and polls the server and checks this every now and then. But you have to decide how often to poll the server. And you have to start worrying about what happens if one component on the screen updates out of sync with another one. Are they going to be correct? You can add some conditionals and you can check that. Or you can just use a subscription in Convex. And we guarantee that everything will show up consistently on the browser. So if you have, say, two separate components on screen and they're both affected by by a number. So let's say um, you have a shopping cart on, on the right and a list of products on the left and we and you know someone changes the price of an item. You want both the cart to update the price and you want the um, the, you know, the shop the list of items to update their price. In Convex they're all you, know, you have two separate subscriptions. We understand both those subscriptions are, are watching the same data. There's a single web socket that all your components subscribe to. And we guarantee we send you the results to the client in an order that will show a consistent view on the client. So that's, I guess, an example where we are required to be rigorous. So there are parts of the Convex stack that we don't bother explaining to a day one user because we don't have to talk about sync protocol and consistent client views and how you know we designed the sync protocol at, the, at, at, at Dropbox and, 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 and at least the sync protocol has been used for the last five years. Um, and how that influenced the, the design of Convex, that's, that's the detail. Well, all the customer needs to know, all the client needs to know is it just works. Don't write your own sync logic. Don't write your own polling logic. That's the kind of stuff that compounds and becomes worse and worse and worse. Use composable abstractions. You don't have to think about those problems again. 
don't add your own ad hoc caching because one day you're going to accidentally read some incorrect data because you forgot to invalidate a cache. That's the, the, the promise of Convex is you can, I guess, ignore whole domains of rigor. You don't have to worry about you know, the composability of some of these infrastructure components because it's handled for you. If, slash when, um, it will become a concern. Uh, obviously, as you've uh, stated before, com Convex is the solution to all of the world's problems. But since we are uh, serious engineers, though, we must acknowledge that there will always be cases where it's not the right solution. Something extremely um, specific, fringe, um, I assume, and you can correct my assumption, since it's still effectively programming that you're doing, you can override anything you want, you can make anything modular that you want, and if you really need um, for part of your data to have a different uh, way to store data or, or a different consistency model, you could program it yourself if there is really no other way. Absolutely. I mean, it's, 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 it's software. You can use it, but you want to use it. Um, but you know, this, you know, this is a podcast where we're discussing convex, but I'd love to be kind of generally interesting to the audience. Right. And we can think about like philosophies for designing systems. How do you design systems that may become complex over time? And let's assume that convex doesn't exist because, you know, it's everything gets boring when you have the greatest platform that solves all the world's problems, obviously, <laughs> but um, I've, I've been part of building some very large systems before, you know, and, and systems that, you know, have budgets, I don't know, in the half billion dollars in terms of, of, of the kind of money have gone into kind of deploying these systems. And there's a great fallacy that, that in hindsight, people think that the authors of these systems sat down and had this kind of genius, prescient understanding of every step that was required to get to the destination. And they just did it step by step and everything worked out, which is completely false, right? And then there's a second fallacy, and you may be able to get me to rant about, rant against data-driven decision-making here. The second fallacy is you can sit down and run, run a bunch of experiments and switch off your brain and let the data make a decision for you. And the result is neither of these things. The result is that when you approach a new domain, you do not know how to solve that problem. You have to have a rough idea where you're heading. Uh, but the, the real key is to break down incremental deliverables that will help get you towards your destination. And, and I call these stepping stones. It's a, it's just a manage, forgive me, a, a you know, buzzwordy management price. Wouldn't those be data-driven, though? Isn't the, so the, 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 the currently no, accepted, yeah. as I understand it, way to... Uh, let's say build a startup for simplicity's sake you start with an mvp which has to be partly obviously hopefully uh, data validated hopefully you did some business research to find niche you, you, but partly also it's just your vision so you have something that brings a minimum amount of value and then you build on top of that hopefully also data drivenly uh by figuring out what your customers want by looking what features are already using are doing surveys, looking at competitors? Uh, yes and no. I mean, data is great in hindsight and data is very ineffective in foresight. So data will allow you to evaluate whether the thing you've done achieves the goals that you have stated. If you say, we're going to change this thing and it's going to save money to the company and it did or it didn't, well, no. If you say, we're going to build this thing, we're going to get new users, we use data to figure that out. But data won't tell you what to do in the next two, three years. Right. That's going to require intuition. And one phenomenon I do see it happens a lot at bigger companies is people start getting afraid of intuition because intuition can get you in trouble. Right? And it actually requires a lot of talent to have intuition. Right? And so you shouldn't just let everyone go off and make you know, um, whatever decision they want. Right? And so you can use incremental deliverables to de-risk things. But the reality is when you start a company, there is no data. You start a company, there's, um, there's gut feel. Maybe you did a little survey that's not statistically valid, right? You have an observation about the world and you have an idea for how you can make the world better via some technical solution, right? And you have to keep that strategy in your mind at all times, right? And the role of, of leadership and, and technical leadership in particular 
is to is is to build a strategy and build a series of deliverables you can you can produce along the way that help get you to the destination and learn things. So the best thing that could ever happen out of a the next product you do is that you learn more about your domain, you understand your domain better, you understand your customer better, you understand how to solve it technically. And then you move forward. And you can use data to validate that. But sometimes as part of a startup, you just have to be in the dark for a little while. You've got to build things for a few steps and and you know survive on 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 the strength of your conviction. Right? Sometimes you have to intentionally go in the wrong direction and you know um, and, and see negative results. Because you know that that's going to turn things around and, and drive you forward. So there's always a role for data when you decide it's time to evaluate. And you should try as much as you can to, to shorten these timescales, build things very fast, build things you can test against the market, against the customer, against the problem as quick as you can. So it'd be a huge mistake to sit there. And if you, if you say, want to build a, a database for a company or a storage system or in any product, actually, it's a huge mistake to say, hey, everyone, go away for two, three years. Just let me do my thing. And trust me, it's going to come out perfect. Right? You have to figure out a way in three months or less to do something useful that you can validate. And But there is, the, the value could be that you get it out in the market and people love it. Or the value can be that you figured out way better how to proceed from there. But I just have this little bit of like a, a pet peeve against blind adherence to data-driven decision-making. Because I think it just, it really um, devalues all the immeasurable things. I've had scenarios before where we've talked about, you know, hey, let's build a database or let's, well, let's not, actually, that's not the right question. You know, how do we solve the data needs for this company? And there's arguments, well, what we should do is just try all six databases and then pick the one with the highest queries per second or the lowest latency. That's measurable. It's not a particularly nuanced framing, right? You know, do we trust the team? Is it written in the language that, you know, can we edit the source code? Uh, is, is it, um, you know, is, is it, is it, is it have good consistency properties? You know, is it, a, is it, is the way that the team thinks about the future aligned with us? Does it have adoption? All these things, right, matter in making a decision. And if fixating on just the measurable stuff means you're going to devalue the immeasurable stuff. So I'm a big d- believer in data driven reflection looking back and saying, did we achieve the goals we stated? And at a certain point, the rubber re- meets the road. You have to be held to task for the, the impact of what you do. All engineers, especially senior engineers, uh, evaluate it on the basis of their impact. But data will not write a strategy for you. That's on you. You have to use your brain. You have to use your life experience. You have to use your bravery sometimes. And you have to use your... Um, organizational sense to figure out how to to get a team to their next goal i absolutely know what you mean uh, annoyingly so even I, I made a few notes to to answer to this but then you talked more and you basically said all i was going to say <laughs> uh, but it is it's it's the, the thing about bravery i think it's really interesting again it brings us back to the human psychology aspect of it you mentioned it before that uh, in bigger companies people are often afraid of exercising their intuition. And um, I, I find it also really fascinating how to foster the kind of culture that encourages people to, um, you know, the whole spectrum of to, to have a balanced life, to have a kind of free and non-preoccupied mind that is then freed up to be able to have intuition and vision and, and feel safe in their work environment to dare to bring for new ideas, even if they're not 100% rigorously tested by data. Yeah, and this is not an, obs- an excuse for arrogance, right? It's not an excuse for just going and, and do, make, do, making unbridled decisions, but it does mean you have to really just think about, are you going through the motions or are you doing the thing that rationally makes sense, right? Now, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a saying, the customer's always right. The customer's always right about the validity of the problems they experience. The customer is experiencing some pain. They're having an issue. That is true. The customer probably doesn't know what solution they need. That's your job as the expert to figure out how to solve that problem. I guess that's the Henry Ford thing. You know, um, I'm not sure if he really said this, but you know, if, if I asked the customer what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. 
right? So you have to have a, a, a deep empathy for the customer. You have to spend a lot of time talking to customers. You have a lot of time doing market research, a lot of time introspecting on whether you're succeeding at your goals. But you can't forget that you are meant to be the expert. You're the one who's there to solve problems to somebody else. All right. So, James, I want to get started with Convex. You know my background. I, I like to say I'm conceptually a good programmer. I can write fantastic algorithms in my mind. If I have to bring them down on paper, I just very slow also. I try um, advent of code every year and I've never gotten past day 13 just because at some point it just takes so long to implement what I have in my head. Um, what are my next steps? You've mentioned Angular. Now I'm an absolute crutch when it comes to anything browsery. I've, I've recently bought a book literally like days ago uh, about JavaScript because um, I'm finally giving in to Edward's Law. You know Edward's Law? I don't know Atwood's Law, but hopefully it says that JavaScript's taking over the world. It sadly does. Atwood's Law ap aptly and, and cor correctly says any application that can be written in JavaScript will eventually be written in JavaScript. So I've decided to stop fighting it. Uh, I won't bore you with my, my story of, of learning JavaScript when I was 15 that traumatized me for the next 15 years. Um, what are the prerequisites for me to get started with Convex. I actually have a, a, a web ap application in mind. It's not complicated when I think about it, but I just don't know where to start. Do I learn JavaScript? Do I have to learn that to learn TypeScript? You mentioned Angular. Can I use other frameworks? Yeah. React. React. But yes, you could use other frameworks. Yeah. Um, okay. First thing, given that I have, a, I have a decent sense of, of who you are as an engineer, right? Skip over JavaScript to TypeScript. JavaScript is going to drive you insane. There's a lot of things in JavaScript that, and in TypeScript too, that are pretty inelegant. There's a lack of runtime type safety. Um, you know, Convex has this concept of, of, of input validators where we, we, we validate at, at runtime that your, that your types are what you say they are. This is going to sound really dumb but I hope that our listeners feel smart if they hear me say dumb things. I, and I realize now this wasn't found, particularly founded, but I just intuitively assumed you had to know JavaScript in order to learn TypeScript because it's kind of a, an extension of superset. Is it possible to just learn TypeScript? Well, yes, they're, they're very, 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 very similar programming languages, right? TypeScript is JavaScript plus types to a large extent. So they, they're approximately the same thing. But I would say, you know, it's very easy for a, um, a non-JS, non-web person to come into this world, um, let's say the web world, and be a little disparaging about it. You know, like, oh, um, why are there not type safety over here? Or why is um, why are there no, like, obvious built-in integer types in JavaScript? You have to use begin if you want to have integer, you know, um, number in JavaScript's a float, by the way. Yeah, why are there a million um, web frameworks and then you then you start realizing no wait um, there's a lot to learn about this world and this community uh, a lot of very sophisticated ideas um, so I would you know I would just start learning TypeScript and I would start looking at something like React React's a very very interesting framework right because React is a reactive web development framework right it's it, it's 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 it'll appeal to people who understand functional programming you write components and data dependencies and those components refresh when that those data dependencies change um so yeah, there's quite a lot of very interesting ideas in the web world people in the web world are very familiar with concurrent programming because there's async everywhere um so there's a there's a there's a lot to um to love about the web dev world a lot of very sophisticated very very smart people who have come up with some really interesting ideas in the space um so if you if you're a let's say you're a, a non-product developer who wants to get started with product development I would, I would go and 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 um, you can pick up TypeScript as you go. It's not like a language like Rust, which you know, I love Rust, but very hard to learn. Uh, you can just you can just get stuck into TypeScript. Uh, watch out for your double equals versus triple equals, which is a bit of a gotcha object identity versus you know equivalence. Um, and um, and then I would I would take a look at React, which is a really cool framework, and then I would try the Convex tutorial. You will have a 
a chat app or a to-do app or, or some kind of you know shopping cart or something like that done in a day. Um, and then uh, you you may you may you may uh, repent for your lifetime of infrastructure work and 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 decide that you want to <laughs> build some products that people will use. It's tremendously gratifying. Look, we have a, obviously at Convex a, a cross section of engineers who work here, and there's people who have spent their life building applications. There's people who've spent their life building databases, and it's always fun just seeing how we have a build on Convex day pretty frequently, where we just take a day that everyone here builds products on convex and everyone loves those days they get so excited like wow i built this really cool thing really fast i think that's that's great it's a great sign for um obviously for convex but f for the software development community having people be excited about building cool applications that they wouldn't have otherwise built especially if if, if there's folks who say stuff like oh well i would never have thought of building an app for my bookstore my, my book club or or you know, whatever it is but now I, 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 I don't find this world intimidating. Um, I'm just going to go build something. That, that's, that, that's awesome from my perspective. It kind of sounds as easy as they always make it out to be in, uh, in, the, in the Hollywood movies and the TV series. Remind me, where do I have to go to get started with Convex? Convex.dev, C-O-N-V-E-X.dev. James, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you, Jeff.